Um, so I'm Elizabeth Hexner again, and uh, schedule is changing a little. We'll have a break after um, my talk. Um, and um, I'm talking about um, splenectomy um, in the era of rexolitinib, and also um, is there a role for uh, radiation therapy to the spleen? Um, and um, I am going to insert a lot of opinion because there's really not a lot of data um, here. Um, so I don't know if you, anybody's familiar with the French romantic poem, poet Baudelaire, um, but he has a, um, a kind of epic poem about spleen. Um, and it actually doesn't refer to the organ. Um, but this um, literary meaning, which is melancholy with no apparent cause, characterized by disgust with everything. And I would say our patients with um, big, unwieldy spleens, I think, often feel this way. Um, and me too, by association. Um, so um, I don't have a solution to it yet. But um, So um, what is the role um, of surgery or radiation um, for troubles, troublesome spleens in the rexolitinib area. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what the indications might be for a splenectomy, um, whether you would do surgery or radiation, or is there an order where you would think about doing that, and then what the expectations are, um, both in terms of cytopenias, um, duration of effect, um, and implications um, for other treatments. Um, so um, I'll start with a case, and this is um, a case that's just kind of uh, always a reminder to me, this patient, of um, how humble we should feel about treatment decisions and how um, therapeutic restraint can sometimes be the right thing to do. But she um, was diagnosed several decades ago um, when she had headaches and was found to have an elevated platelet count. Um, she had a kind of non-diagnostic marrow, and she was called ET, um, but several years later um, had progressive anemia. Her platelets um, were rising, and her spleen was palpable, and she sh had um, a diagnosis of um, myelofibrosis at that time point. Um, she actually had three um, consultations at various centers um, uh, who uniformly recommended allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, despite the fact that she didn't have a fully matched related donor, and she actually deferred it. Um, and um, she um, just was observed for a very long period of time. Um, in 2006, um, she uh, got a JAK2 test, because JAK2 was discovered, and she didn't have it. Um, and then she started to have some um, more um, symptoms associated with her splenomegaly. Um, she did eventually get a clonal diagnosis with a calreticulin mutation, um, and at um, one point she was started on erythropoietin. She had this dramatic response and this um, unexpected reduction in her spleen size with erythropoietin, which isn't supposed to happen. Um, and the um, point is, she has this very active lifestyle. Um, she uh, is a triathlete, um, and it's very hard to think of anything that could make her feel better, even though she does not feel um, that she's um, at her highest level of functioning. Um, she's um, feeling a little constrained by her, the size of her spleen and abdominal discomfort, um, and um, the question is whether um, this patient, who's actually probably kind of much earlier, less advanced in some respects with her disease, even though she has advanced disease, might benefit just by a simple surgical procedure. Um, and what might the risks be? Um, so the medical option is out there. Um, and um, it is um, dramatic and safe um, and fast. So for most patients who have symptomatic splenomegaly and myelofibrosis, um, the answer is rexolitinib. Um, virtually everybody has some reduction in their uh, spleen size um, and um, an improvement in symptom score um, at the expense of some anemia, which most people can tolerate, although um, I use this case because I think this patient would be tipped over into transfusion dependence and uh, really does not want that and has no nothing in the way of constitutional symptoms to control. 
Um, so I think prior to ruxolitinib, the indication for splenectomy was discomfort, but like real discomfort, uh, recurrent splenic infarcts, for example. Um, we can now often uh, prevent uh, recurrent infarcts with ruxolitinib. Um, the um, use of cytopenias as an indication for splenectomy, I think, um, could be called into question, although it is out there as an indication. Um, whether you can actually improve those, I think, um, is a, a matter of debate. I also don't think you can worsen them. Um, and then portal hypertension is often used as an indication, although that also uh, may not um, change in terms of hemodynamics with a splenectomy. Um, so very limited data, both for radiation and splenectomy. Um, the, um, there are several uh, case series. Um, the Mayo has um, one of the larger ones with 223 patients um, who had a splenectomy over a 20-year period of time. Um, the indications were um, cytopenia, symptomatic splenomegaly, um, and um, severe thrombocytopenia um, for um, some of them. And um, I think probably the first bullet point is the most important one, which is um, an operative mortality of 9%, and this is at a major medical center. Um, these are patients who tend to be um, quite ill, although well compensated, and this is a really major surgical procedure. Um, and so I think um, just that operative mortality is one major reason um, to avoid splenectomy. Um, they found in their series um, median post-splenectomy survival time of 27 months. There had been out there in the literature a concern um, for a more likely, you know, could it hasten the transformation to acute leukemia? And I think not. Um, these patients um, tend to be just really advanced in terms of their disease. Um, uh, there can be a pretty severe reactive thrombocytosis and sometimes clotting post splenectomy, um, something to be mindful of in the perioperative period. Um, and um, the overall conclusion from their study um, is that uh, there may be a palliative role for um, splenectomy. And of course, again, this was in the pre ruxolitinib era. You probably can't see any of this, and I don't think it really matters. Um, there weren't any, any variable that was particularly predictive other than um, thrombocytopenia, and I think this is more just a marker of um, very advanced disease um, in these patients, and also another cautionary um, thought about taking these people to a pretty major surgery. Um, so how about radiation? Um, there are also um, pretty limited data uh, looking at radiation um, in patients with myelofibrosis. Um, and really um, variable in terms of dosing. Um, so the median is quite low, although it ranges um, from 50 to 1400 centigrade, um, which is very high, um, usually in multiple fractions. Um, most patients um, have severe treatment-associated cytopenias. Um, for anybody who's uh, had a patient who got splenic radiation, these can be actually very profound. Um, and um, there is a duration of response, um, so it's not, um, it's not durable for years, but um, anywhere from five to 11 months in terms of um, duration of response. Um, the um, other thing I was going to, oh, and, and in terms of, I think one important um, take home point is perioperative mortality looked like it was much higher for the splenectomy patients who had had radiation prior to it. So if you're considering one or the other, um, if you, if I, would, I would not recommend radiating a spleen um, if there's any chance you're going to be taking the patient to the operating room because it ends up being a much more uh, complicated surgery. Um, there's always, of course, um, the risk of post splenectomy infections in patients. So uh, careful pre pre surgical um, immunizations is recommended. Um, there's also one of the um, only large multi center studies looking at. Um, allogeneic stem cell transplantation, which was done through the EBMT for primary myelofibrosis, um, had this interesting finding of 
um, an increased risk of relapse in patients who had had a splenectomy pre-transplant. And of course, there are probably a lot of confounders um, that go along with that. But I think um, it definitely goes against a dogma, which I think is outdated, which is that patients should have their spleens removed pre-transplant. Um, but I, I think it's another consideration if this is a patient you're thinking about for a transplant. Um, the last case is um, one um, where I'm going to ask you guys the questions because I don't know the answers. Um, this is um, another patient who um, is 70, um, who's had progressive splenomegaly. He has a long um, history of an MPN, um, again, several decades, um, and um, has had uh, intermediate and now advancing disease. Um, he eventually was started on ruxolitinib when it, when it, once it became commercially available um, and had um, uh, multiple actual infectious episodes, which are kind of unexplained, um, but um, had a nice response initially, but then had progressive splenomegaly uh, despite being on maximal dose ruxolitinib. Sorry, you can't read this very well. Um, but the um, question was whether this patient should get radiated now that he has progressive splenomegaly, which wasn't, which was massive, but wasn't um, uh, super, super symptomatic. Um, and so my questions are, how, how do we manage rexolitinib in, in these patients? Um, are you obligated to stop it um, because of overlapping toxicities? Um, and um, what, um, what would you do um, for management um, post, post splenic radiation? Um, so I think these are uh, more enigmas to address. Um, I would say, uh, in, and this is heavily opinionated, um, I think medical therapy is vastly favored over um, surgery and radiation um, in patients who have symptomatic splenomegaly. Um, there may be a, a role for splenectomy in selected patients, um, and uh, I would say even um, a smaller role um, in, um, for radiation in patients um, in the ruxolitinib era. Um, and that's it.